door. It was for this a child was born to save a world so cold and hollow. The sleeping town they did not know that lying in the manger low, a savior king who had no home has come to heal our sorrows. Is there room in your heart? Is there room in your heart? Is there room in your heart for God to write his story? about the most exciting event to ever happen in our world, the birth of Christ. Luke's gospel lays out a story filled with anticipation, intrigue, wonder, and hope-filled news for humankind. It was the day when God's great plan of salvation and redemption was irrevocably launched. And as we look to the cast of characters God gathered together, our eyes are open to a new response, focus, and growth in the Christmas season. Today, we'll look at the angel's joy in response to Christ's arrival and find our own as we proclaim the arrival of Jesus Christ. Growing up, one of my first recollections of my father having a LP. Anybody remember what LPs are? Vinyl. Okay, 
had the big console, yeah. right? The two speakers on either side had the big lift up top and the record player in the center. Remember that? And then you had the little things on either side that you could store all the records in. Remember that? Well, his favorite, uh, uh, I don't know what you call it, his favorite record at the time, I don't know if I was in second or third grade, but it was Fiddler on the Roof. Tradition, tradition. Remember that? I just love Fiddle on the Roof. I grew up loving that song. And Christmas is a time for tr traditions. There's all sorts and flavors of them. And no doubt you probably have some, even some you don't know about. But you just automatically do them. Some people light their house. Some people go out and find the scraggliest tree they could find intentionally. Other people have special foods. Anybody have special foods at Christmas time? Yeah, a few of you. Uh, in our house, we got the, uh, the Jets box. No offense to the Bills fans, but uh, they were giving these away way back in Schenectady. This is going back 25 years ago. They were giving away the Jets box. They couldn't even sell them. They were giving them away, and so every year, it's so beautiful. It's a shiny Jets box with green logo and says Jets. Every year, we re-gift something in there to an unsuspecting person. So it's always, who's going to get the Jets box this year? Uh, when I was little, we also had uh, Advent calendars. Remember those? And you would open up the little door. There was one door every day of the month for Advent, and there was a little scripture inside, and you would read that. And if you're lucky, there was a piece of candy, too. So that was a big tradition for us. Well, there's some other traditions around the world. In Sweden, every Christmas Eve at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, about half of the nation's population sits down to watch one TV show. And it started back in 1959, Walt Disney's TV special, From All of Us to All of You. It's also known as Donald Duck and His Friends. <laughs> Wish you a Merry Christmas. But almost everything comes to a halt in Sweden at 3 o'clock on Christmas Eve. And they just stop and put themselves in front of the TV and watch. That has been happening. This is the 60th year they've been doing that. So if you lived in Venezuelan capital of Caracas... Uh, you might be happy to know it's a tradition to ride roller skates to morning Christmas Mass. <laughs> In Greenland, it's a tradition that men serve the women dinner. Oh, yeah, isn't that great? <laughs> well, not so fast. Where do you hear what they serve them? <laughs> the main dish is strips of whale blubber. <laughs> That's the good part. <laughs> as well as a delicacy. Did I say delicacy? Yes, I did. Called kiviak, which is where they take hundreds of dead auk birds, feathers, birds, beaks, uh, feet, everything, stuff them inside a seal caucus, I'm sorry, a seal carcass. They sew it up and then they hide it under a big rock for about three months to let them ferment. And just when the decomposition, uh, when it starts to decompose, they bring it out, it's ready. And that's what they serve. Whale blubber and that decomposing bird inside the seal. I think I'm gonna fix dinner for my wife this year. And when it doesn't come out, so I'll just remind her of this. It could have been that. Anyway, closer to home, a little bit lighter and a little bit more palatable note. Uh, you might have heard this, but this is an interesting tradition that started back in 1964 be, uh, between a guy named Larry Kunkel and his brother-in-law, Roy. Back in 1964, Larry's mother gave him a, a pair of moleskin pants. Didn't even know there was such a thing. But he lived in Minnesota, and they would freeze. And so Larry regifted these moleskin pants to his, his brother-in-law, and he didn't want them either. So the next year, he regifted them back to Larry, uh, wrapped in a uh, metal pipe. And so this started a tradition, and it's been going on. It was for about 25 years here. The packaging became more and more difficult to open. Roy once sent the pants to Larry in a 600-pound safe that he welded shut. <laughs> Larry returned the favor the next year, and uh, he, he got a 1974 Gremlin automobile. Remember those? 
and he had it crushed at the local impound salvage yard to a three by three foot cube. And there was a little note attached to it that said, P.S., the pants are in the glove box. <laughs> you would think that would be the end of it, but it wasn't. The next year, they returned it in this huge 600-pound tire, and he put the pants in uh, with 6,000 pounds of concrete. And you think that would be the end of it, but it wasn't. It just got more and more elaborate to finally, the, the year 25, uh, Roy got an idea to, to encase the pants in 10,000 pounds of jagged glass. And unfortunately, what happened was that some of the molten glass got too close to the pants and burned them to ashes. So the 25-year tradition just ended right there. So anyway, traditions can be fun. They can be serious. Some of them can have no meaning whatsoever. Sometimes uh, it's not just something we're brought up with. Maybe it's something that society imposes upon us or by default we accept it, like going crazy with our schedules. You may or may not think that's a tradition, but if you do it every year, it's a tradition. Uh, going crazy with buy, 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 spend, spend, spend. You know, you got to get up at 4 in the morning, 3 in the morning, whatever else, on Black Friday, or wait, you wait for Cyber Monday. There's nothing wrong with spending some money and all that. I'm just trying to say we can get swept up into this stuff and not even think about it. Well, this year I want to challenge you to adopt two new transitions. I'm sorry. I want to challenge you to adopt two new trans traditions that line up with the spirit of Christmas. And here they are. Adopt a tradition of staying in the peace of God. Make up your mind. I mean, I'm going to, this is going to be my tradition. I'm going to stay in the peace of God all whatever shopping days left till Christmas. I'm going to stay in the peace of God. And secondly, I'm going to pass that peace on to others as best I can. Wouldn't that be two great traditions to start? Keep myself in the peace of God and to try to pass that same peace on to other people. Now we're going to read our scripture for today. It's found in Luke chapter 2. It's about the angels showing up to the shepherds. In verse 8 it says, Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you glad tidings. The one time a year we can say our word, right? Glad tidings, name of our church. I bring you good tidings, glad tidings of great joy, which will be for all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord, and this will be a sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. And suddenly, when this was said, there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God, saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace and goodwill towards men. Let's pray. Lord, we want to open our hearts and minds up to what you got to speak to us today. We know you always have something that you want to share with us. I pray each person here, myself included, would be have ears to hear uh, what you would speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen. So, the angels proclaim this good news of what kind of joy? Great joy. Good news of great joy for who? For all people. That means whether you receive the news or not, it is still good news and it's still for you or still for me, still for your neighbor, still for your ungodly person, still for Larry and Roy. Who knows what they're sending back and forth to each other now. For everybody here. And then the angels respond with glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace. He didn't say on earth, stress. Amen. Didn't say on earth, anxiety. Amen. Didn't say on earth, exhaustion. Amen. Didn't say on earth, it's everything the American culture is all about for Christmas. No, he says on earth, peace. Amen. Now it's important to understand the peace that the angels were proclaiming. They were not proclaiming about world peace. 
Now, one day that will eventually come when Jesus comes back. But he's not, they're not talking about world peace, not talking about the end of strife or struggle or war. It's, it's not an announcement that now everybody magically is going to get along with each other. I mean, does, when Jesus comes into your life, does that, those relationships improve? Yes. Absolutely, but still, they're not talking about that peace. They're talking about, first and foremost, peace with God. Peace with God. Until Jesus came and until he died upon the cross, we had what waiting for us. Even though God loved us with an eternal love, there was the eternal judgment that was hanging over us because of sin. And this is a message of, of love. And I often say if, if God could send a Hallmark card, this would be it. You know, when Hallmark, you care to send the very best. He sends Jesus so that he can take the wrath of God on him. And then our sins could be judged. But in Jesus, now we're forgiven and we're free. And we can experience peace with God. And so it's through Jesus that this barrier between us and God has been removed, has been dealt with. And we see an example of this in Luke chapter 7. We're not going to go there, but you might want to write that down. The scripture says that there was a woman who lived a sinful life. That could be any one of us in this place. There was a woman who lived a sinful life. And in verse 48, Jesus tells her, your sins are forgiven. Beautiful words, freeing words. And then in verse 50, he concludes, he says, your faith has saved you. Go in no, wrong woman. Go in peace. Oh, <laughs> Confusing your Bible stories. But he says, go in peace. Because of the forgiveness of sins through Jesus, we now have peace with God or can have peace with God. If we choose not to surrender our lives to Christ, we don't have that peace with God. But the angel said, peace on earth, though it is possible. Why? Because today, this day in the city of Bethlehem, in the city of David, is born to you a Savior, the Messiah, who's going to die for the sins. The baby that's born in the manger is one day going to die on the cross. And then we want to complete the story. It doesn't end there. He resurrects, and then he ascends to heaven, and then Revelation 19, a few years from now, he's coming back. That'd be so cool. Wouldn't you like to see that? Yes. I think I'm going to change my screen name to Revelation 19, you know, or I don't know. You want to be on the right side of Revelation 19, don't you want to be? You don't want to be on the wrong side of that. Some of you are like, what is Revelation 19? Read it. You want to be riding with the leader of the pack on that day and not left behind. So he talks about being having peace with God. And then what happens is this peace that we have with God manifests itself in peace with ourselves. And so this is a byproduct of having peace with God, having peace within ourselves. And this peace is for living, peace for our soul, peace for our emotions, peace for our priorities, peace in our lifestyles, peace in our goals and our ambitions. Whatever our dreams and our desires are in our, uh, um, I don't want to say striving after those things, but our pursuit of that stuff, because we're lining our lives up with God, then we can have peace or alignment with our lives. But when we don't have peace with God, we don't have peace with ourselves. I got a few pictures here. I want to show you the first one. It actually had a contest. and You may have seen this before. But they said, we, we were going to give a, a prize out for the best picture of peace. And so this was the artist picture here of peace. And so you can see in the background there, the lightning's going on. And really, if you could get up close, it's the storm is going on. And it's really not so much the picture, but what's in the picture. And so we're going to zoom in a little bit on why this picture won. Do you see it? There's a bird in a nest. While all the storm is going crazy and all the water's pouring out all around it, here is a bird in the midst of that, safe and secure. And there's really, this whole picture was based upon biblical principle. Uh, that picture of the bird was really a picture of us being hidden in the cleft of the rock. Isn't that cool? We can get a little bit closer here. You can see the, the bird nestled in there, in the nest. Now, one thing this picture doesn't show, but we're left to our imaginations that possibly... There are some chicks 
underneath that mother. And if you know anything about chicks or children or when we're younger, we're totally oblivious to the danger that's going on around us. And this just shows how God keeps us safe in the middle of the storm. We don't have to be concerned about everything that's going on around us as long as we're safe underneath the feathers of his wings, so to speak. We can have peace. Now we're going to pull out again. And in this picture, there's a picture of Jesus. If you didn't know it, you might not have looked for it. Do you see it? Okay, let's zoom in. It's a picture of Jesus. The rock of ages. His face. Do you see it there? The, the Leaning over the ledge there to the left. Well, in this picture, there's also some other things. We can go to the next one. Do you see anything familiar? Do you see a cross? It talks about the peace that we have with God and the peace that we have with ourselves is all because of the cross of Jesus. And all because Jesus is watching over our lives and he's hidden us in the cleft of the rock. Now in this picture, we're going to leave it right here. You may or may not be able to see it, but that cross is actually um, superimposed over the head of a serpent. Taking us back to Genesis 3.15 where it talks about how uh, the serpent would bruise Jesus' heel, but that Jesus would crush his head. So if we back back out to the full picture here, with all this going on, we have Jesus watching over us, but there's always that serpent there waiting for an opportunity, but the cross of Christ renders his efforts powerless. Praise God. And there we are, hidden in the cleft of the rock. And so this picture won what it means to have peace. So it's not an absence of turmoil. It's not an absence of conflict. It's not an absence of every, you know, trouble. It's knowing God in the midst of the trouble. Yeah. Knowing that you belong to God in the midst of the struggle. Yeah. And so we need Jesus to have peace with God. We need, then have peace with ourselves. And it's not just peace for our living. It's also peace for dying. We don't like to think about this, but I'm telling you, without Jesus, I wouldn't even know what the, such fear would be in a person's heart, facing eternity without Christ. Now, no doubt, when you and I get to that day or that moment or whatever else, there will be some type of fear or trepidation inside of us, but I will go out on a limb here. I think we feel that because we're looking at our feelings, and the, our, as Christians, we're not to look at our feelings. We don't ignore them necessarily, they're, re they're real, but if we look at our feelings and, and doubts and all that kind of stuff, we're going to be uncertain, but we're told to focus our life and our dying on the promises of God. And so if we have peace with God, we have the promises of God. And so we have an assurance that goes beyond the grave. We have an assurance that's anchored in eternity, not based upon how well we lived, but based upon what Jesus did on the cross, how well he died, taking all of our sins upon himself in the judgment of God. And so we throw ourselves upon the mercy of God. I mean, we should live that way anyway. Amen? And so this is the type of peace that the angels are talking about here, peace with God, which manifests itself in peace inside of ourselves, peace with ourselves. And then, as much as we're able to, as we are led by the Holy Spirit, we then have peace with others. Now, notice I said, as much as it lies, what? Within us. As much as it depends upon us, we can live at peace with others. But for the, their part, we have no control over that. And so the angels are not necessarily even talking about that, but they are talking about peace with God, and it's going to manifest itself in these other areas. Sadly, however... Christmas is nothing more than a reminder that we lack peace. Rather than resting in the peace that God has given, we're reminded that we don't have that peace. And it's not that it hasn't been given to us. It's not that we don't believe in Jesus. It's that we're not aware of what's going on. We're so caught up in everything else. We're missing the whole story. Right? Christmas becomes a time of stress for most people. And a time of anxiety, a time of exhaustion, a time of strife. 
If nothing else, then these mess, this reason alone should encourage us to establish these new traditions. Yeah. Okay? So what are those traditions again? Number one, start a tradition of staying in the peace of God. Make it a priority. I'm going to stay in the peace of God. And two, I'm going to pass that peace on to other people. I'm going to give that gift to others. You know, it's more valuable than an iPod. It's more valuable than an iPhone. It's more valuable than a new Samsung 4K, 8K TV. To give the gift of peace. Amen. I can see some kids now on Christmas morning. Pastor said, just give you peace. <laughs> I took your PlayStation back. <laughs> Tradition number one, staying in the peace of God. Before we can pass it on to others, we have to possess it ourselves. Okay. And so it's difficult to share the message of God about his peace when we're all stressed out. And so let me give you some things that have helped me. They may help you. It's been my experience in order to stay in the peace of God that I need to have time to pray. Uh, not SOS prayers, quick shoot them up like a flare gun. You know, like, save me, God. That's fine. But I'm talking about where, where you just put the world on hold. And you take time to pray. And second thing I need is the word of God. I need to be able to read the word of God. Amen. And then the third thing that helps me is to have time aside. This helps keep life in perspective. This helps keep Christmas in perspective. Time of prayer, time of being in God's word, a time aside. And what comes to my mind when I think about time aside, I think of a busy subway station. Anybody ever been in one? Subway station? Coming and going, coming and going, right? Just coming and going. People coming and going. We're caught up in that. That's the Christmas... I don't know what you would call it. The Christmas current. We get caught up in it. And time aside is like, hey, I see a bench. I'm going to step out of this flow and sit. And I'm going to take some time while the rest of the world's going crazy, back and forth, back and forth, getting on, getting off, getting this, getting that. And I'm going to sit and I'm going to have some time to pray, some time to consider the word of God and pray over the word and see what God might speak to me and just have time aside with God. It doesn't have to be a lot of time, but it has to be time. Five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, whatever it might be. Think about Sitting down with your favorite book. Anybody like to read here? I know a few of you like to read. You, you just can't do that. Oh, I'm going to sit down and read now. I'm just like, okay, I'm done. You got, no, no. You want to sit and you want to read. You want to get captured, uh, caught up in the story. You want to really process what's going on. And sure, the world's going by crazy. And you, I love just going. I love being in the mall. I don't go to the mall very often, but when I go, I like to go. I don't like to go into stores. They're way overpriced. Way overrated. But I like to go and sit while everybody else is going crazy. And not necessarily people watch, but it's, I just find it relaxing to just, to just be there. I'd rather go and instead of eating at home by myself, you know, when my wife might be away or something, I'd rather go in the middle of the public and just sit and take my time and eat while everyone's going crazy. I, this may sound weird to you or something, I don't know, but that's the mentality that we need, that I'm just going to go spend some time with God and let the world go by. Amen. And that's the Christmas season. Let the world does what, do what it does. I am not going to get caught in it. I'm going to stay in the peace of God. And so establishing this tradition of staying in the peace of God means I recognize that full schedules probably not, are not of God. Having to do everything all the time is probably not of God. I get so caught, we get so caught up in the tradition of what the society has made Christmas, we don't even stop to think, is this healthy for us? Is this healthy for me? It's like, no, it's not healthy for anyone. I, I'm not against you shopping or whatever else. And I do that too, but we need to build that, that space or that white space, that margin in our lives. And the, the angel said it was good news of what? Great 
joy. Here's a question that's worth writing down. If it is news of great joy, and I'm not experiencing joy, then it begs the question, am I really taking time to consider the significance of what the announcement means? If God says this is, this is God's estimation of what Christmas is, it is a time of great joy because the message is such good news, great, great joy. Are you experiencing any joy at all? And if you're not experiencing joy, you have to ask yourself, are you really contemplating what this announcement means? Are you taking time? Think about it. And that's one of the reasons why here at Glad Tidings we want to take the whole month and try and encourage you to uh, contemplate that. We're giving out this, we mostly already have it, the Castle Christmas devotional book. I don't know what day you're on, but I think I'm on like day 14 or 15. But you just read one of these, pay attention to it, spend some time, and they have little ideas on new Christmas traditions you could start or songs you could sing or whatever else. Very simple, very well written. Each one's only a, a page uh, per day. But you read this, and if you don't have one, you can pick up one on the way out. It'll be our gift to you. But not just with that, but also with Sunday uh, services, Wednesday nights. We have thoughts that go along with this theme. Trying to just encourage you, encourage ourselves to just contemplate the meaning of the angel's message. The meaning of Christmas. And you can still go bake, and you can still go shop, but keeping things in their proper perspective. Amen? So we need, to make, we need to make a Christmas tradition of scaling back the world stuff so we can have time for the God stuff. And I'm not talking about going to church. Okay, you guys already got that down. You're here today. But I'm just talking about escaping the craziness of things. Matthew 14, 16 says the people who said, I'm sorry, it's, I don't think it's Matthew 14. It might be Matthew 4, but it says, The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. You know that scripture? The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. And then John writes about that light. He says, And that light shines in the darkness, but the darkness did not comprehend it. In other words, this light was all around them. The plan of God was all around them. The meaning of the season was all around them. It was all around them. The angels were there. The shepherds were there. The magi were coming. The, everything was happening. The prophets beforehand. The angels there. The shepherds. It's all around them. The message of salvation is all around them. And yet, they missed it. They didn't comprehend it. They were so busy and doing whatever else that they missed the meaning of the message. They were, think about this, they were in the midst of the great light of God, and yet they were clueless. What a picture of Christians in the United States of America at Christmas time. We are so surrounded by the meaning, so surrounded everywhere, and so often we are clueless about it. Oh, yeah, 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 I know that. Get this over, I gotta get home, you know. Yeah, 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 I understand that. No, really, really, really think about it. He's, the angels, there's one angel by himself talking to the shepherds. They're freaked out by one angel. That would be me. Freaked out. <laughs> and he's, don't be afraid. Hey, because I'm bringing you good news of great joy, which is going to be for all people, the entire world. A Savior is going to be born this day in the city of David, who is Christ the Lord. And then suddenly, in response to this, the whole heaven fills up, the whole sky fills up with this multitude of angels, and they are not saying anything to the, the shepherds. What are they doing? They're praising God. It's like heaven just opened up, and we get a picture around the throne room of God, and it's they're praising God. Glory to God in the highest for this news. And on earth, peace, goodwill towards men. They were not even thinking about the shepherds, man. They're just praising God for this great news. I, folks, we need to be in that multitude. Get so caught up in the, in the message that, wow. Wow, but that's only going to happen if we have time. So I want you to know, some of you are like, well, I, I don't know. Uh, you know, I got to go, 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 go. No. Uh, imagine 
having the peace of God in your life this Christmas. Still doing what you got to do, but having the peace of God. And so wouldn't it be a great tradition? By God's grace and by God's message, that's his gift to us. Peace. And on earth, peace. Not, and on earth, stress. Endless to-do lists. Anxiety. Craziness. Can't wait for it to get over. No, none of that. He's peace. I could use some of that. So you, you, guys, you guys can do more than just survive the holidays. Some people, that's the goal, just to get through it. I can understand if they're difficult for whatever reasons, but I'm just saying, even in that, there's the peace of God. Instead of just surviving, we can be thriving. So stay in the peace of God. And while you're there, let's try and start the tradition of trying to pass that peace on to other people. So the remaining part of our time, we just want to focus on this. What do I mean by passing the peace of God on to others?